recording the the webinar today and I, I just realized I forgot to hit record. I'll go quickly back to this present presentation slide. Jess, can you just give me a thumbs up or recording now? Great. So yeah, we are recording for the plantwise and pollination networking for your garden presentation. All right. I did a quick review of the agenda. Um, I also want to quickly thank all of our sponsors, funders, um, and partners that work with us across the region. As a nonprofit society, we rely on grants and partnerships and um, small fee service work. So we are very grateful to a number of, of funders. And a quick introduction to the Columbia Shushwap Invasive Species Society. So we call ourselves CSIS, kind of like the spy agency. Um, we are a non-for-profit charity um, and we work in partnership with a number of folks around the region, including um, public and private landowners, government, indigenous peoples, stewardship groups, uh, various government agencies. Um, and we work together on invasive species management, education, um, and prevention. So a bit more about some of our programs. You can see in some of these lovely images, some of the work that we do um, to educate and engage folks. So that's public education programs that we do around the region, both on aquatic and terrestrial programs. Uh, and then we also establish and operate invasive species management programs. So as of right now, we do quite a lot of um, water monitoring for invasive zebra quagga mussels. That's uh, our aquatics program. And then our terrestrial program does a lot of invasive plant uh, management and inventory around the region as well. Just to locate us, there might be folks on the line from across British Columbia or even farther away. Um, so our organization works within the um, region of the Columbia Shushwap Regional District. So you can see here on the map of BC, kind of in the southeast corner of BC, it's a beautiful region with lots of um, lakes and mountains. And um, if you are interested in finding, if you live elsewhere and you're interested in finding the regional organization, there is a link here and this will be in the presentation materials that I'll email out later to other contacts around BC. So you can see in the different regions of BC, there are other regional invasive species organizations um, and sometimes uh, government agencies or regional districts that also work on invasive species. Um, and um, I'll see if I can, I can't, I can't copy over this link into the chat box, but um, like I said, I can send it out in the presentation materials. Um, so I wanted to give a quick intro as well to what invas what the term invasive species mean. As I mentioned lots so we work on invasive species. So an invasive species is a non-native organi organism. Um, so that means it comes from elsewhere in the world um, or maybe even elsewhere in North America. Um, and they have a high dispersal abilities. They can um, and, you know, get around and move around sometimes quite easily. Uh, they're very adaptable to um, different environmental conditions uh, and they may not have any pathogens or predators in in the new environment which means that they can do do very well have rapid reproduction um, they can sometimes tolerate a very wide range of conditions and that makes them easier to invade and um, some of the impacts of invasive species is a reduction in um, biodiversity there are also social and economic impacts, um, impacts to agriculture and crop yield. Um, for aquatic invasive species, some of them can um, damage water infrastructure and dams because of cleaning um, pipes and things like that. So I won't go too in depth into invasive species as you can join with some of our other webinars that are more focused on that. I wanted to get to um, the topic of horticulture because today we're talking about plant-wise and pollinators and Horticulture is a pathway for invasion, which means that the buying and selling and trading and moving of invasive plants uh, or of plants can sometimes bring in invasive plants. Um, and as of right now, it's not illegal to buy or, or sell invasive plants in BC. Um, there are some local bylaws in some regions um, that are working to change this and some movement provincially um, to look at a new invasive species regulation, but uh, we do outreach to garden centers in this region and talk to them about not buying and selling invasive plants. Um, and as a consumer and a customer, you can also go to them and provide impact, in, input and feedback on the plants that you're buying. Um, and um, 
there's a program that is run provincially um, called PlantWise. And this is um, an education program for garden centers and gardeners. Many of you likely that are here today are interested in this realm um, to educate folks on what is invasive and, um, and uh, what are some alternatives that you can grow and um, sell. So something to be aware of in particular is the wildflower seed mixes because there sometimes are invasive plants in those mixes and you can um, look on the back for, for the list of plants. One to watch for is something called bachelor's buttons. Um, that's an example. Um, these invasive plants can sometimes germinate quite quickly, grow fast, reproduce prolifically, and, and as a gardener, they might be that sort of plant that takes over your garden. But we're worried, what we're, we are worried about is them escaping the, the garden to the natural environment and causing um, problems there. Some other examples of um, invasive plants to watch for are blue weed, um, bachelor's buttons, morning glory, baby's breath, and mountain bluet. There's some photos here as well. And um, what we're trying to get folks to do, how, how, we, how you can help in this regard is uh, be PlantWise, take a look at the online resources and um, for PlantWise, and I can send a link to that as well. Um, and just think about not using non-invasive plants in your landscaping. And uh, Brenda and Val, our guest speakers, will speak more to pollinator friendly and native species. Um, but uh, just in general, thinking about yeah, not planting invasive plants is because there's there's seeds and um, sometimes other parts of the plant can can spread out out of the garden. If you do have any invasive plants in your on your property, um, you can bag and landfill um, them and bring them to the landfill. Uh, in our region, the CSRD, it's free to dispose of invasive plants at the landfill. Um, and just notify the attendant and, and make sure all of your plant material is properly contained in a bag and, and not, um, not able to, to spread as you bring in the load. You could also um, uh, become organized with the community or, uh, weed pool and um, look at cleaning up a local park or area for, for invasive plants. And um, if you want to organize something like that with us, we are happy to help, help you organize and host a weed pool. Um, within the regional, the Columbia Shishwap Regional District. Um, and then one final way is, is to report invasive species. Uh, and I think I have a link a little later as well, but um, reporting any invasive species that you find around BC and around our region helps us um, get in touch with the land managers and ensure we're, we're containing the ones that are high priority, uh, containing and controlling <laughs> what we can at least. The Grow Me Instead resource is something that's part of the PlantWise program, um, and it gives you alternatives for other species that you can plant. Um, it lists the 26 most unwanted plants in BC uh, and gives you those suitable alternatives that might be similar shape and, and look. Um, and so it assists gardeners in, in shifting, <laughs> shifting buying patterns. So this is one of the resources to look for on the PlantWise website, and, um, and I'll, I'll be sharing that link out. Yeah, used widely across BC. Yeah, and here's the a little look into what the reporting app looks like. Um, for those of you that have smartphones um, or iPads or things like that, this is an app you can download from the, the App Store. If you search for Report Invasive BC on, on your App Store, you can download this. And what's really nice is you can search by um, flower color or name of plant and then send in an instant report. Um, on the app and it'll record the location that you're at. If you're out of cell service, it will, it will have taken the GPS point from where you hit report. Um, and you can also report things directly to us at CSIS if you're here in this region. Um, depending on the priority level of your species, you may or may not get a report. So if it's a really widespread species, um, there's too many reports that come in about those species, so you may or may not get a response on that. Um, but if it's a high high priority species, then um, it'll get forwarded right away to the correct land manager. So we appreciate all of your support in, in helping gather that information. I also wanted to highlight quickly um, that we do have one other uh, workshop coming up if you wanted to learn a bit more about invasive plants and ways to manage them. Um, we're highlighting yellow flowers at our next course uh, on May 27th at 10 a.m. and you'll find 
um, a link to that on our website under workshops. Um, and um, we can put, put that in the meeting materials as well. Uh, and Laura Gaster, our field coordinator, will be running that. Yeah, so that's my quick intro spiel. And we can get into pollinators now. And um, we're so thrilled that uh, Brenda and Val were able to, to join us as guest speakers. So a quick introduction to each of those two lovely folks. So Brenda Beckwith is, um, has a PhD and she's the principal of Kinseed Ecologies. She's a plant ecologist and ethnobotanist and has helped people discover and incorporate native plants into home gardens and restoration sites in both BC and California. Kinseed Ecologies offers native plant, native plant seeds, consulting, and native plant propagation services in the BC interior. Valerie Huff has a Master's of Science and is a restoration botanist with the Kootenai Native Plant Society and the director of the Native Bee Society of BC. Valerie has been a professional botanist in the West Kootenai for over 25 years. She's the co-founder of the Kootenai Native Plant Society and her love of plants and extensive training and knowledge in restoration ecology, plant propagation, and agronomy informs and enlivens both her work and her life. So a quick thank you. Um, you, you can, um, as I say, we'll receive an email from our info at email um, with all the resources, but I'm going to stop sharing my screen and allow Val and Brenda to get going with, with their presentation. All right, can everybody hear us? Yes. Awesome, all right, so I'm Brenda. That's I'm Val Valerie. That's Valerie. And yeah, we will start sharing our screen. We're gonna tag team it here, step in and out. So hopefully it's all really clear and smooth for you all. So let's do this. All right, and get this up and rolling here. All right, wonderful. So I'm going to move that back over there. I'm sorry, I'm getting okay, organized. Okay, how does that look, Valerie? It looks fine here. How does it look for you? All good. <laughs> looks perfect. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Thanks. Nice. Great. Right. So yeah, thanks for inviting us today. We're we're excited. So I just wanted to start with this this quote. So we're in a climate emergency and a biodiversity crisis and what we plant and how we alter landscapes matter. And we think that there are really positive things that people can do um, to actually help the biodiversity crisis. So um, I wanted to break down the, um, the title of our slide. So, First, pollination. So we hear a lot about the pollinator decline, um, but plant diversity and pollinator diversity are so intrinsically linked that you can't really separate them. This graph shows, um, this is a global pattern from a, a global study of plant species diversity and pollinator diversity. And you can see that as you increase the number of plants on a landscape, you increase the number of pollinators on a landscape. Um, so loss of plant diversity drives loss of pollinator diversity, which drives loss of plant diversity and so on. So fortunately, there's something we can all do about this. And as this graph shows, um, for every plant species you add to an ecological uh, system, you add at least one pollinator. Diversity is magic that way and what we plant, mat what we plant matters. Okay. So that was pollination. Now networking, we often think of pollination as a bee pollinating a single flower. But in fact, these are multiple interactions between multiple species um, through time and space. And this is what lends um, stability and resilience to a system. So you add another flower, you add another pollinator. Um, so that's how, that's the magic of biodiversifying. Okay. Now, in the real world, this is what a, an actual pollination network looks like. And this is from a study that was done um, in Glenbow Ranch Provincial Park. Um, uh, along the bottom are the different plants. Along the top are the thousands of different pollinators that visit those plants. So 
ecology is messy, as Brenda likes to say. So like, uh, like Robin defined a, a, an invasive plant, I, I'd like to define what a native plant or a native pollinator is. And really you can't say that something is native without saying where it's native to. So native plants and native pollinators occur naturally in the ecoregion and habitat where through evolutionary time, they co-evolved with all the other species in the system. And that includes plants and pollinators, but it also includes us. So I just wanted to kind of walk you through an example of this. Um, so when we say, what is a native plant? So here we have the beautiful uh, common camas, Camassia quamish, which if you look at the map that's on NatureServe, it's native to British Columbia and Alberta. So is it native to all of BC? Well, no, it's actually native to two little regions in BC and a tiny little piece of Alberta. So it just fingers up into here. And the populations in each of these three regions are quite distinct. So yeah, so, so it's native to, the, to those regions. And then you drill down even further into the habitat. And even within our region, um, it's, it really only occurs in a very narrow window. And historically, there are points that are, uh, there are, there are herbarium collections that are north of Nacusp and reports of it growing as far north as Revelstoke prior to the, prior to the dams. So common camas may actually be native to the Columbia Shoe Swap as well. All right, so I'm gonna pass it over to Brenda. All right, so I'm gonna tag in here. Hi everybody, so lovely to be here. Uh, today. So let's keep going here. So now we're just going to try and reimagine what the garden could look like. If I will, maybe let's just ungarden the garden a little bit here. Um, I've come up with some major themes that we're going to introduce and then come back to a little bit later on in the presentation. And the first theme is just start, right? And you can do that by starting locally and establishing what the need is. Now I understand Revelstoke is now a bee city, that's great. So how can we look deeper into that need in terms of the pollination networking system? So first start the addressing the need locally. Conventional gardens are typically defined by, you know, the limitations, right? Think about the words we use, beds, borders, boundaries, that sort of things. These plants go in this part of the garden and these plants remain in this, this part of the garden. We, and we hope they don't escape out of those gardens, right? Let's blur those boundaries a little bit, right? Shift to seeing and working within the opportunities. We love to go and spend time in our gardens, but typically we view gardens as a place to go and work in and shape, right? and not something to work within um, and really try to learn to understand. Do what you can, but start. And so here's some, some things. I mean, you don't have to jump in with both feet. For example, you could just start introducing native plants into your existing garden. That's great. What a wonderful place to start. Right? Or you could take it that next step further, maybe do some what's called nature scaping, right? That's where you might put in a native plant hedgerow, one that flowers or one that even has berries if you're in an area um, where you can support that. Uh, a pollinator meadow like we're talking about today. This is where you start recognizing different values of the plants. Or you can take it that next, next step further and actually do something that's called rewilding. And this is where you take it more of an ecological landscaping or gardening approach and, and really look at the system as a whole, as a viable and working ecosystem that is working within your yard, but also connected to other places, uh, neighboring landscape. So then from start, start learning. Right? So conventional gardening practices often have unintended uh, negative consequences on, on biodiversity. So how can we shift that to include more beings within our garden in a way that really makes ecological sense for your home space? 
right? Slow down, observe, right? Take the time to look at what you have, pay attention to it, learn from it, and figure out what will work best for your space. So learning the ecology, if you wanna be plant wise, right? Learn ecology, it's the best thing to do. An invasive species here may not be an invasive species over here, depending on different ecological conditions, you don't know. So try, be cautious, get your resources, learn from people and proceed uh, slowly. So for example, think about water. Where does it come from? Where does it go? Does it stick around a while or does it you know, shed off pretty quickly in, in your sight? Think about sunlight. Also, where does it come from? Realize that there could be a forest on the south side that blocks a lot of sun or a building on the north side where it might actually be a really great warm wall to, to build, uh, to plant um, certain species in. So think about sunlight, where it comes from, where it goes and how long it sticks around. Soil conditions, very important. Right? What is the soil composition? Does your soil hold water or does it shed water? Right? What are the, the components of your soil? Um, if you're working on a site, you know, do you actually have the parent soils or are you working on infill? So all kinds of really interesting ecological conditions to pay attention to and learn from. The next theme is build. Right, so we, as you'll have probably learned or will learn when you start, right, and start learning, then you realize that there's not a whole lot of capacity to fully support you yet in your endeavors to incorporate native plants. But we're getting there and we can get together there, get there as a, as a community. So start building connections, creating capacity. Right, go for a, a hike, see what the biodiversity is like around you. Try. Plants are very forgiving. Make mistakes, let them teach you. Remember, they've been at this a whole lot longer than we have, so they know what to do, and they'll certainly tell you if you put them in the wrong spot. Embrace messy, as a Valerie already introduced. It's one of my favorite words. But realize that, you know, when you cut down those plants at the end of the, of the season, just because you want to tidy up, right? It might look good in the yard, but you're probably getting rid of somebody's house, right? Someone's home that they need to overwinter in. So think about how you can kind of shift your gardening approaches a little bit to better support all those beings that are going to be using your garden. And we realize that even microhabitats can be really important habitats and e increase ecological diversity. All right, and then finally share. This is where the networking really comes in. And Valerie introduced it as an ecological term, but really we do need to see ourselves as part of this networking system. And so continue to make observations through the seasons. Keep a rewilding journal, keep track of what you're learning, um, the mistakes that you've made and, and what you've taken away from that, right? Reflect on what you're learning and reach out and foster community support and share what you know and your skills and even maybe some plants and some seeds. That is a good way to start building a community of people making meadows, making hedgerows, incorporating native plants. So we have some examples for you. So the first example is our friend Janet out at Six Mile and near Nelson here in the West Kootenai. And you can see the transition here over the years. And so what's really interesting is when you start doing this work in the, in the first year, we say the plants sleep. Right, they're just trying to get established. They got transplant shock. They're trying to figure out like, hey, I'm in this new spot, what's going on, right? So sleep is in year one. Year two or three, they start creeping. Their roots are sitting, are starting to get established, right? They're starting to kind of throw out their botanical elbows and, and, and take up space, but they're starting to kind of do something and look like the plants that you intended to be there. And guess what? Uh, year three or more, then they actually do make the leap and they start looking really good. 
So it requires some patience. Again, it's not like a garden where you take the plant and you put it in and boom, instant garden. No, it takes some time, but that's what, that's how you, nature works, right? And you do want to build um, those ecological systems in this way. An example from our yard, actually, right out, right, right out there, actually. Um, so this little space, as you can see, here's from one May to the next May, just this was taken last week, the second photo here. And what I wanted to draw attention to here is that what is in this small space are plant, were, was planted with, with plants um, that were young potted plants in 2019 um, that we largely grew from seed, right? Previously in our own home nursery in just three square meters, 10 species supporting bees and pollinators from May to October. So you don't need a lot of room. Right? You can just start what I lovingly call a habit patch. And you could just create your own little patch in your yard. And it's a great place to start, right? And learn of what you got. And now um, we're well into the creep phase because that Nooka Rose is sending out runners like crazy. Thank you very much, Nooka Rose. And um, yeah, so now I'm actually propagating cuttings from a plant that I put in the ground that I grew from the seed several years ago. Right, so that's pretty cool, I think. All right, so I just wanted to highlight a, a project that the Kootenai Native Plant Society that Valerie and I are both associated with called Wildflowers for Pollinators. And we're now heading into our third year. And this is uh, Leah's Meadow up at Shedding Bench, which is near Caslow. And you can see it's a new build and uh, she's solarizing a, a slope that's southeast facing. And uh, so part of this project is creating a Kootenai Lake seed library. What a great idea that we could do for Columbia Shushwap as well. And that is a way for people to contribute to the library, collecting seeds. We have seed collection workshops, and then those seeds are readily available for people for meadow making. Um, a really neat community ground um, grassroots uh, effort there. And you can see in just one year, she's already getting really nice um, species development and many, many bees are being attracted to that meadow already. And so she's going to continue seeding. We're going to continue working with her and expanding that um, meadow over time. Just quickly uh, working with the Butterfly Way Rangers in, in Castlegar uh, at the Kootenai Gallery of Art. So this is a reimagining of a, a native plant garden there. And actually just in a week's time, I'm gonna be back and we're gonna solarize um, part of that area uh, behind the garden um, for a, a bee a pollinator meadow. So we're expanding um, this year as well. So that's quite fun. And finally, uh, we have uh, been working uh, a little bit um, in your area and that's so much fun. So working with Sharing uh, Consultants Limited and CSIS uh, Blanket Creek, we provided seeds um, that went out to that restoration site. And I'm very happy to say that I'll be working with Ron Glaive. And I believe you're, you're here, Ron, if you are, hello, um, on his project that is funded by BCB program. And I will see you also in a week's time as I, as I come up. Maybe there'll be an opportunity to, to meet some of the rest of you as well. All right, so that was really quick, but I'll hand it back over to Valerie. Thanks. So now we get to meet and greet some of the plants, some of our native plants that are great for our native pollinators, because native pollinators actually need and have special relationships with our native plants. So the biodiversity in British Columbia is, is completely amazing. Um, so there are more than 2000 species of native plants. We have over 450 species of native bees of, from six different families with an incredible diversity of, um, of lifestyles and um, plant choices and all of those sorts of things. Um, there's more than 250 native butterflies in British Columbia. And then there are countless other 
other organisms that act as pollinators. So moths, wasps, flies, beetles, thrips, and hummingbirds would be our only, um, our only bird pollinator in British Columbia. So within this incredible diversity, there's so much to choose from. So, so we've chosen a few to highlight some of the fun and quirks and quandaries of, of, of gardening for pollinators with native plants. So first up on the list is silverleaf phacelia. Um, our friend and colleague Lincoln Best says that if you're going to plant any wildflower species in your garden, plant silverleaf phacelia. In fact, he's been known to say, plant phacelia or die. Um, so this is our common low elevation dry site phacelia. There is a high elevation phacelia, which is stunningly beautiful and another um, smaller phacelia as well. So you want, you want bees in your garden, plant phacelia. Next up, pearly everlasting. I think it's a totally neglected garden plant pulls in the pollinators like crazy. Um, and it's super important for fly pollination as well. So think beyond the bees and the butterflies. And then there's fireweed, which grows in, you know, which we all see in the wild and love. And it's just stunning in a garden in the right, in the right place. Okay, and these are all pollinator superfoods. Okay? Then there are a few more other great pollinator plants. Um, that are well behaved in a garden border. Um, so silky lupin is one of our native lupins, absolutely beautiful. Um, uh, round leaf alum root, this was in our yard yesterday. This is um, Heuchera cylindrica here with a, with a small native bee, a native bumblebee. Um, and we, so many of us in, in our gardens, we have alum roots or coral bells. There are a wide number of them. So why not actually try one of our native ones and connect with the heuchera that's growing around you? And finally, we have the beautiful nodding onion, which grows throughout our forests and you get it in your garden and it grows well and easily. And then, so not every plant is suitable to a garden border. So we have what we call the aggressive rewilders. We could th consider these the invasives of the native world. Um, but these are also absolutely critical for pollinators, but their aggressiveness is also a trait that you can use to work with your, to work in your garden. Okay, so first up we have Western Canada goldenrod and the next up we have yarrow, um, just, it's just beautiful. You can also put it in your lawn and mow it and it actually forces the flowers lower and, and they're really, really great. Um, next up in the aggressive plants, all basically all of the asters, absolutely critical late in the season um, and beautiful, beautiful, beautiful for, for, for borders, okay? So then not all native plants are Easy to, easy to grow in your garden. And if you're going to start trying to learn from native plants and bring them home, think about, um, think about some of these. So we have the beautiful blue camas, um, which is ethnobotanically a super important plant. Um, it grows readily from seed, but it takes about five years before it blooms. Next up, we have the beautiful scarlet paintbrush. We all love these paintbrushes. Uh, this particular plant, however, uh, really is very challenging to grow from seed. You cannot transplant it. So if you're gonna plant it from seed, you need to collect the seeds locally, plant them in your garden, and hopefully it will grow. This one is actually in, in Leah's meadow, and um, it grew, it flowered in the first year, but you can't expect to, to go buy, buy it at a nursery, nor should you ever, ever, ever go and take it from the wild, right? Because it won't transplant, um, and you're just really poaching the plants. And finally, we have the beautiful Columbia lily. Some people call it the tiger lily. Um, this is such a beautiful plant. Um, it's a, an incredible plant for butterflies. However, it has really quirky seed germination characteristics, a minimum of two years before it germinates. Um, 
and sometimes up to five years before it germinates. And then it takes at least 10 years before it flowers. So perhaps this is a plant that's best admired in the wild. Okay, and there are so many great shrub options. I'm not even really gonna start, but I wanted to highlight a couple of them. Um, we often hear about, you know, no mow may for the pollinators so you don't cut down your dandelions because they're the first things in the spring to, to bloom. I disagree. Willow is one of our first things to, to, to bloom and it's so important for pollinators. So this is a beautiful green comma uh, butterfly, one of our early spring butterflies. And this is one day, uh, six, actually we, we documented nine different species of bees on a single willow um, in, uh, that, this was uh, about a month ago. So it's super important for diverse bees early in the season. Okay. And next I wanted to show you this beautiful shrubby penstemon. It's, it's gloriously in bloom on the rock cliffs around you today, look, look for it. Um, and it is so important for, pollinate, for pollinators. So this is our, uh, our map from the earlier system turned sideways. Um, so you can see that shrubby, this is actually shrubby penstemon. And over here, all of these links point to a different pollinating species that visits shrubby penstemon. This is everything from bumblebees to thrips, to flies, to, to beetles, um, which are potential pollinators of shrubby penstemon. So of all of the species in their, um, in their documentation, this was, this was the pollinator superfood. All right, so those are just a few of your amazing options. And it's back to Brenda. All right, back at it. All right, that was, um, that was great. I wanna go spend some time with them. Um, so now we're going to launch into pollination networking tips. So we wanted to end with some more concrete um, that's, that's a horrible term to use for this type of <laughs> webinar, but some real tangible things that you can do following the same themes that I introduced earlier. And this is our cute little QDB um, that we pretty much put in every single presentation we do. So let's start with start. Choose a location and determine how it is ecologically situated, not necessarily like I want my wildflower meadow to go here in my yard because of these other reasons that may be your values, but where is it actually best in your yard thinking about the entire outdoor home space. And so what is the situation um, from an ecological point of view. Right, so then this is where you start asking those questions. Where's the sun coming from, right? We want for a pollinator meadow or a hedgerow, we want sun, we want some moisture. Um, we, you know, are there current plants? Are they invasive? Are they weedy? Or, you know, are there native plants that we want to keep? Um, all of these questions and the answers to them are going to help you decide how are you gonna prep that site? Because just identifying the site doesn't mean that you're ready to go. No, it needs to require some prep. So you prepare the site through clearing, through solarization, through sheet mulching. Again, the method often is based on how much time you have, how much labor you wanna put in, but often what is the best approach? So we recommend solarization because Xerxes Society of Invertebrate Biology recommends that. Um, that was seen in Leah's meadow from Shoddy Bench, um, but sheep mulching could do or just hand manual clearing as well. Valerie, can you just take a quick moment? There was a question about solarization and, and explaining what that is. Uh, with what? Sorry? Ex explaining what solarization solarizing is. Okay, so as if you remember back, thank you, uh, remember back to that uh, picture where the clear plastic was on that uh, southeastern facing slope at Leah's place. Um, what it does is it's basically a way of killing off the plants underneath. And so what it does is it creates like a uber greenhouse effect, right? You stretch that clear plastic over your piece of 
of future meadow and it cuts down oxygen it heats up crazily and uh holds moisture and the plants take off and then they realize they can't that can't be sustained and they will die off so the idea is to get that sheep or that poly or that plastic out early like now and leave it on through october right and then pull it off do some some basic cleanup and then you're ready to go so it's a, a really good way to kill off um, the plants underneath as well as if you get it hot enough then some of those seeds in the upper seed layer layers can also um, be killed. Hopefully that answers the question. All right, so that actually leads actually really nicely into planting actually is best in the fall um, following what nature prescribes. Uh, so we recommend planting and seeding in the fall um, and because a lot of our native plants need something called cold moist stratification and winter provides that naturally. So even here in our um, Ken Seed Nursery, we seed in the fall, everything goes out, there's no greenhouse, it goes out and let winter do its thing, and then seeds coming up now in our nursery all over uh, in the springtime. So start. The next one, if you recall, learn, all right? Start small, roll it out in phases, right? and build capacity as you go. As I mentioned, there isn't, you know, big, beautiful native plant nurseries around, but there are small people or small organizations, small groups of people doing these, this type of work and building that network, right? But you can start your own network on your own place. Keep a journal, track, Phenology over time. Phenology is just a fancy term for the timing of plant development and growth. Create a micro nursery of your very own. I say if you're going to actually jump in to this planting and maybe rewilding on your yard, set aside a small portion. You can produce literally hundreds of plants in a couple of square meters. You don't need a lot of room. And so start your own nursery, harvest your own seeds, and then you can expand from there. That's how you can roll it out in, in phases that way and support yourself and maybe even support your neighbors and your friends as well. Deal with those weedy plants as needed. Weeding has been around for thousands of years. It's not gonna go away anytime soon. Create a meadow, create those meadow hubs either on your own property or convince your neighbors to have one too. And then um, you can all learn together. All right, and this is where the magic starts happening. Valerie used that term earlier and I like it because it does seem like magic. I'm amazed. I've been a botanist, you know, I would say all my life. And uh, a trained botanist for all my adult life. And um, I'm still amazed every single time I go out and even in my garden, let alone going out for a hike in some of our beautiful natural areas that we have here in the BC interior. Build, the third one, right? Start, learn, build. So once plants are growing and beginning to flower, one to two years, depending on the species, right? 10, if you got Columbia lilies, um, the pollinators, they will come, right? Build it and they will come. And the great thing is, is if you start linking in those little hubs around the community, they will find each other. Some butter butterflies don't go very far from their home patch. However, some bees can, you know, fly five miles. So there is ways of building what's called connectivity. Linking to other meadows will expand that connectivity, but build in pollination resilience, right? We're looking at continued habitat loss, a climate crisis, right? The best thing that we can do is develop these patches of uh, native plant ecosystems or focused ecosystems, and we need to build in that pollination resilience so that particular system doesn't crash. Augment your meadow with different plants to fill in the gaps and phenological um, 
and, and phenological gaps as well. So in both space and time, right? So you might have some plants that do really well. You might have some plants that do too well and you wanna separate them or give some to your friends. Um, but you might also have some gaps that you wanna fill in with other species. And you also want to have, you know, bloomers that are going to have, you know, like your willows start in February, March, and then, you know, then your hazelnut, your alder, going into some of your early species, but you also want it to carry on through the end of the season, maybe September, maybe October, right? And, and support bees and butterflies, flies, hummingbirds throughout the entire season. So that would be kind of neat. Monitor, right? You don't have to do fancy scientific monitoring. You can just go out, keep your journal, see what's visiting, see who they're visiting, how long they're sticking around. Um, and, and those are really important things to learn and to share um, with other people. Ponder, right? We don't do enough pondering, I don't think. Um, so go out there and, and think about it and, and just spend some time in that space and, and see who's using it. And, um, maybe something new will come to mind of how, how best you can uh, use, that, use that space um, for yourself, for your family, and for other beings, and most importantly, have fun. And share. Remember I, I said this was, this is critical. We've been doing this work for here in the Kootenays for over 10 years. And really, if we're going to have societal change, if we are going to want to do this regionally and do it well and support each other so it's sustainable, we need to share and it needs to be a grassroots effort, right? We need to advocate for native plants and share what we have. So foster that community of enthusiastic, skilled, capable meadow makers by sharing. Share what you've learned. Right, so that's keep track of it, share it with other people. Share resources, right? Um, people that you come across that have good information, websites, publications, webinars, that sort of thing. Share your new skills, share your labor, right? Don those gloves and go help out of a friend for an hour or so. And finally, share seeds and plants, keeping genetic diversity alive in the Columbia Shushwap in the West Kootenai and the East Kootenai is so critically important. And so share what you have, keep those, keep that networking going and, and build capacity. And um, yeah, we, there's only uh, flourishing meadows to come, I'm sure. So that was a lot of information. We wanna end with, with two more slides, uh, if you'll allow us the first one. And this is a lot more to take in, but uh, you'll, you'll have this presentation, right? And so uh, you can review this at a later time. So at the top, I wanted to review just, or let you know about two Kootenai Native Plant Society ongoing projects. Like I said, we're in year three of three of our wildflowers for pollinators that is based around Kootenai Lake. We just started a, a wonderful, huge, initiative, a five-year project called Pollination Pathway Climate Adaptation Initiative with 17 sites and multiple partners. And it's crazy, but it's wonderful as well. And I think there's a few of our students who are working with us this summer, hi, um, on, this, um, on this webinar. So uh, it's a really neat initiative. So please stay tuned with that. I uh, give a shout out to some friends who are also West Kootenai native plant, uh, people who are, are connecting people with, with native plants. There's us in the middle, Kinseed Ecologies, both Valerie and myself, now working uh, proudly in the Columbia Shushwap, the East Kootenai and the West Kootenai. And before we, we call it here, um, also we've been working with uh, CKIS, our very own invasive species. Uh, society and uh, consulting on an eco garden project. So please go to their website. It's a really neat new initiative um, that is 
trying to provide resources to people. Um, there's a native plant list that we contributed to, but also a recommended cultivated plant list, a do not plant, right? Notice how that's in caps, do not plant list, um, suppliers and more on that. So check that out as well. And we're really happy to be partnering with them. And we are so thrilled that CSIS um, came and and invited us to be a part of this webinar. This is how we can um, make this work happen and get some native plants out there and support our native pollinators. And without, with that, we'll leave you with that. And thank you very, very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Valerie and Brenda. What a joy to have both of you um, present with us and share all of your knowledge. I'm I'm going to be going back to all these slides and digging around more myself. Um, if folks have any questions, feel free to chat in the in the chat box or um, throw up a hand, and we'll be able to see you there. We do have five minutes for questions. Mm -hmm. Folks are taking it all in. <laughs> I have a question for you. There's so many invasive, or sorry, beautiful native plants there. Um, and just to clarify, those were plants um, to look at for for this region, this sort of the Kootenai, including the Columbia Shushwap, um, I'm guessing a little, but um, for folks, I guess, that are, I'm guessing there might be some folks that are not in this region. Um, are there any similarities or other resources, other groups like you elsewhere in the province that they could look to for resources? Um, yeah, so many of those plants are very widespread, but there is so much plant diversity out there. It's really about getting to know your native plant diversity locally. And so, yeah, it's like, I think there were 10 or 11 plants that, that we highlighted, maybe more. Um, but each one of those came could have been numerous others. So yeah, we absolutely selected for plants that um, grow in the Columbia shoe swap. That was our that was our or used to in the, or in used to camas. in the case of camas, right. likely likely would have grown there. Um, the uh, there are a couple of other organizations that are that are working provincially, and I yeah. So Saanich Native Plants and the Island Pollinator Initiative is something that I'd like to highlight for people who are on the who are on the coast. Um, yeah, and, and we could also highlight um, Orion at Sagebrush Native Plant Nursery and Oliver if there's people from the Okanagan. Right, fantastic. We do have a question that's just come in. Are there any good tips for collection of seeds from the wild without causing damage to wild areas? That's a great question because we we tell folks don't, don't go digging up native plants. <laughs> but collecting, yeah. what are your thoughts on collecting uh, native seeds? Without so causing my my yeah my thoughts are it, it, it we absolutely need to do this with serious caution, um, and we are in the we we developed for the Kootenai Lake. Um, Wildflower Seed Library. We developed a manual with some with some guidelines. That's available on our website to download. As a general rule, never collect seeds from a plant that you don't uh, you can't a hundred percent identify, mm -hmm. um, and never collect more than ten percent of the seed that is available at the site. And also collect from at least a hundred plants to capture the genetic diversity. So it is, so it's very simple to collect seed. You're not going to harm anything if you collect a, a handful of 10 or 12 seeds um, uh, when, when you're out somewhere. But if you're doing more seed collecting than that, that's when you have to be really careful. So if you're just doing it for yourself, I think you can be very, just be cautious, take, take a few, and make sure that you grow them. Don't leave them sitting in little envelopes uh, <laughs> like I do. Oh, no. <laughs> um, yeah, so immediately get them on the ground. Great. And I, I would add uh, a couple of things. One, so when we're looking at sites for seed collection, always harvest from healthy populations. 
and plentiful. Like if you're gonna get 10% of a population that you see, right? So that 10% is not more than 10% of the seeds on a plant, but it's also, as you look around and see a population, it's not more than 10% of all of the plants that you see, right? And so you need to be able to assess that. Is it a healthy, pop, healthy population? I mean, you're not gonna go out and if you see four plants, it's like, eh, should I? Eh, probably not, right? The population needs them. <laughs> so make sure, you know, assess the population itself and whether or not it makes the most ethical sense to take seeds from that population. And then I also wanted to say as part of the pollination pathway project, through Kuninia Plant Society. Uh, this year, we will be starting a um, seed collection manual for our region that might actually evolve into a formal BC, uh, BC interior wide seed collection manual. So stay tuned. Fantastic. Um, we're at 11 o'clock. Can we do one more question real quick? Um, the Question is, would you recommend solarization for converting lawn to meadow? And you could just have a quick, quick answer on that one. <laughs> Let me say no. No. <laughs> <laughs> but a quick answer is start small. So, and for lawns, because they, the grasses can be so aggressive, you, you really need to remove the turf. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. You, you, could sheet, you, <laughs> yeah. Could, you could sheet mulch, right? You could build up rather than try and take the labor of removing the sod, you could take a patch and literally lasagna layer it, right? Sheet mulch it up. And then that grass becomes organics that gets incorporated into the soil as it breaks down. So that's another alternative. Mm -hmm. Great, fantastic. Well, thank you everyone for coming today. Um, as, it, as we did mention at the beginning, this will be recorded and posted and there'll be a follow-up email with a number of links. Uh, if anyone does have any questions, you can email us. Uh, or find us on our website and have a wonderful afternoon and the rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. -bye.